I thought I might try something a little different. To take a box containing old CD-ROM games, give it a shuffle, and see what's at the top. That unfortunately turned out to be Spirit of Speed 1937, so anyway, here's Screamer. Oh, this is good going, isn't it? Even for me. Mere seconds into a new exercise and I've already undermined the sanctity of its fundamental premise. Well, let's move on and consider another fundamental problem, that of getting a CD into a computer far too modern to feature an orifice for optical media. Oh, slightly dusty Asus portable drive to the rescue. And what even is USB power restriction? If it works, it's fine. Not using a nicely packaged GOG installation does mean I can show you what would have been my first impressions of the game some time in, if increasingly patchy memory serves, about mid-1996. I did not buy many of my games on release day for full price. Screamer has a very stylish setup screen. Ignore my rather overclocked 486, called by Liquid Nitrogen, and let me tell you how this is something which games around this time did play with while I set things up. On PC, this would have been your first impression of a game, and making it nice is kind of like car manufacturers who give their door handles a really pleasing action to make you feel good before you've even got in the car. Speaking of getting into things, the intro is a very 90s a track loop of the game playing itself, and this does randomly select between different tracks each game start to inject a bit of variety. But let's talk about the name which came up on the screen. Graffiti Software were Italian, a studio founded by Antonio Farina, who had been around in the games industry since the late 80s. He'd noticed during that decade that while there were a lot of games around, many of which were programmed in Europe as a whole, there didn't seem to be all that many from his native Italy. So he formed Ideasoft, with the aim of publishing and showcasing games from Italian developers. Ideasoft published about a sort of low double digit number of games around the turn of the decade, including an Amiga game called Bomber Bob, which, in its home market, came bundled with a cassette tape featuring a song from local comedian Francesco Salvi, with samples from that same song used in the intro, thanks to the Amiga's digital sound hardware, which developers actually bothered to use. Not that I'm still bitter enough about the circa 1990 Amiga ports, which ignored the sound blaster in favour of supporting only PC speaker some 33 years later, but... No, I am, and correcting that is quite high on my list of potential TARDIS missions. Butterfly effect? Be damned. Farina left idea in 1992, desiring to run a proper game studio that released games internationally rather than commissioning code from freelancers mainly for the Italian market. He wanted games that reviewed well for being good games, not just games that reviewed well because they were Italian. This studio was called, well, you know this because it's how narratives work, Graffiti Software. Graffiti started out with a brief flirtation with 16-bit consoles, but in the wake of Doom started fiddling about with the PC and similar raycasting engines, producing a mech game called Iron Assault. This struggled to find a publisher, but in 1994 things changed. A developer called Antonio Martini presented Graffiti with a demo of a 3D engine he'd written, showing a spaceship flying between buildings. This was a bit unexciting, but Graffiti turned this into a car racing along a track, at which point they crossed paths with publisher Virgin Interactive. Virgin had a sudden lightbulb moment. They already published several racing games for the PC, but these were largely serious simulations like IndyCar racing and NASCAR racing. After all, that's what the PC did. Sensible grown-up racing games for sensible grown-up people with sensible grown-up beige boxes. <clears throat> Eggshell White is the official name, actually. Virgin reasoned that if they published an arcade-style racer in the vein of the then-new Ridge Racer or Daytona USA, they would create and thus have the entire PC arcade racing game market to themselves for several months until other publishers caught up. With this in mind, 
Screamer was put together over an intense nine-month crunch and released at the very end of 1995 into a market that was hungry for a PC arcade racer. When I say hungry, I'm talking ordering both cod and a saveloy in the same meal hungry, having a crispy duck and pancakes course hungry, naan rice and a mushroom bhaji as sides hungry. Sort of feel hungry myself now, but where I'm going with all those takeaway analogies is that the Sony PlayStation had released in Europe in September, bringing with it an excellent home conversion of Ridge Racer. PC Market was hungry for an arcade racing game, and with Screamer, it suddenly had its own Ridge Racer, with some obvious influences, especially in this bumper cam mode with the big rev counter on the bottom right and some very recognisable tunnels. I'm going to talk about those tunnels later. Oh, you know I'm going to talk about those tunnels later. But first, I need to get into the game, and here is where my trusty Asus Portable Drive let me down, or more realistically, my attempts to use a variety of DOSBox incantations to pretend it is a genuine vintage drive, plugged in via genuine vintage IDE cable and presented to the operating system using genuine vintage MSCDEX let me down. Not to lift the lid on the world of video production Shea Timberwolf, but the next few minutes kind of went like this. I don't want to use the word transitional, but I'm going to use the word transitional. Oh, that's not worked. Copy protection doesn't work. <laughs> okay. Minor problems, minor teething issues. Please say I've got IMG, but no, I don't have IMG burn on this computer. Am I just, am I just going to download viruses at this point? Da -da 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 -da. Image burn is dangerous, so Chrome has discarded it. Uh, is it really? Is it really dangerous? Uh, desktop icon, I don't care. <laughs> Just want to get an image of Screamer going. No, no, I don't care if there's a newer version available. If it works, it works. Right. Just want a thing to do a thing. That's it. There we go. Just click it. Oh, that's such an effect. Remember when you used to point a camcorder? at the TV, and it was just <laughs> Let's cover up OBS in the most scientific and correct way so that you cannot see the infinity mirror. I know you like putting outtakes on things, but this genuinely, like this, all you're doing, this is all outtake. Six minutes remaining. That's a lifetime. Impossible amount of time. Nobody has an attention span that's six minutes long. I don't stop recording at any point. Never. The recording never ends, just like Mr. Bones' Wild Ride. Oh, we could play Roller Coaster Tycoon too while we wait. <laughs> that would just... Yes. Yes. Yes! No, I'm doing this. This is happening. I'm playing Roller Coaster Tycoon 2 while I wait. Yes. So, so what I have managed to do in this section is be no good at installing games and be no good at playing Roller Coaster Tycoon 2. I'm so good at this. Because... <gasps> oh! Did I even get a little Mariachi tune? Is that what Chrome was trying to protect me against? Right, fine. I've got an item. I don't care, I'm playing Roller Coaster Tycoon now. At least having to indulge in an entirely unreasonable amount of Jimmy nudgery to get my game working put me into an authentically 90s PC gaming frame of mind, which is particularly important when it comes to assessing Screamer. Thing is, in 1994, it felt like the PC had finally seen off the 16 bit home computers and the consoles when it came to games. Nothing else could do Doom quite as well, though the Atari Jaguar put up a decent effort. On a fast 486, platform games like Disney's Aladdin and Lion King looked just as good as they did on console. The PC was finally the ultimate gaming machine, if you ignored the small detail that a good one cost more than a second-hand car. A situation which Nvidia and motherboard manufacturers do seem to be doing their best to bring back. Then the PlayStation came along and brought with it slightly wobbly 3D acceleration. While those polygons might have warped and shimmered, the PlayStation could deliver more of them, at a higher frame rate, in many more colours than the PC. It also had a variety of clever tricks, such as being able to use the frame buffer as a texture to 
surround tracks of racing games with jumbotron screens showing the action. At which point you see Screamer and yes, it wobbles a bit in places, the draw distance is clearly a bit rubbish in SVGA, but on a 486100 in 320 x 200 resolution, neither of these things are noticeable and it really does feel like maybe PlayStation owners shouldn't be showing off just yet. Or playing it now while I can see the comparisons to Ridge Racer. The one I really notice is Daytona USA. The graffiti team claimed that game was just as much an inspiration and you can see just how much Screamer wants to be Daytona USA in places. It's similarly full of huge animated trackside props like the cable car on the Alpine level, a fairground on the Night City level and a fantastic helicopter sequence on the Sandrock Desert level. It also has another Daytona homage in this reflective glass effect. While real-time ray tracing may be on the cusp of taking over if you believe the man in the leather jacket who'd like to sell you an expensive graphics card, for years games used environment mapping as a way to give objects such as cars extra shine and realism. This is an approach where the car is rendered with a base texture, then an extra texture containing the reflection of the environment is blended with it to give a shiny vehicle. But this requires support for multi-texturing, the ability to render two or more textures on a single surface and blend them together. Even the PlayStation didn't have this in 1995, although later games would approximate the effects by rendering a second polygon with a translucent texture, which the hardware did support. While Ridge Racer featured tunnels, there were no reflections on the car. Instead, it just got a bit darker, because even on the more powerful arcade hardware, this was all that could be supported. On a PC with software rendering, Blending two textures and then working out the resultant colour on a 256 colour palletised display was far too much work for the processes of the time to do at a decent frame rate. But Daytona and Screamer both use a simple cheat. Use a single texture for the car's glass to represent the reflection and let the player's imagination fill in the rest. It's surprisingly effective and Screamer takes it one step further by changing that texture to match the tunnel roof whenever you're in a covered area. See, I told you I was going to talk about the tunnels. Screamer also had another development cheat, which got graffiti in quite some trouble. Despite hailing from the land of Ferrari, Lamborghini, and even being based in the same city as Alfa Romeo, famous for their sonorous V6 Busso engine, graffiti decided the best place to find an engine sound sample was the CD-ROM of Papyrus' NASCAR racing with some slight modifications. They didn't expect Papyrus to notice. Papyrus, sir. Uh, kind of did notice, and this must have made things a little awkward, given in Europe they both shared the publisher Virgin Interactive. Another potential sign of hasty development is the dashboard view, which is definitely from the sticker on the monitor school of doing things. Playing this game is a weird sort of nostalgia for me, because while I did own it, I didn't play it that much. And this is mainly because I wasn't very good at it, which is a problem, because Screamer has the classic arcade racer template. You start off with a small amount of tracks unlocked and need to play the game's championship mode to unlock more of them. Now there are some additional modes such as the time attack, a cone carnage mode where you try to knock over cones and a slalom mode where you try not to knock over cones, but for longevity these rely on the extra tracks being unlocked and if you're not so good at the championship then guess what? No tracks for you. Another problem is that I didn't have the opportunity to come back to this later. Because there's a very narrow range of CPUs between being too slow to play the game and so fast it crashes mid-race, getting worse the faster the processor. Even my K6200 was enough to trigger the latter frequently enough to make the game unplayable. Now, thankfully with DOSBox I can dial in a speed striking just the right balance between being fast enough to play an SVGA while not so fast that the game crashes. While not forward thinking about CPUs, Screamer has some great analogue control support. It's one of the rare games from the era to play nicely with an Xbox controller, a device which didn't become the de facto PC input standard until nearly a decade and a half after Screamer released. There's a lovely proportionality to the controls, although they are very much from a period before Simcade became the norm for arcade racers. Feeling like somewhere in the code is a line saying, if speed is greater than X, then skit. Similarly, the brakes are almost completely useless, serving 
mainly as a control to engage some sort of strange drift mode for a fixed amount of time, which you don't usually want to do because that time is inevitably far too long and you lose speed all the time that weird drift mode is active. I know I joke about arcade racers being the ones where brakes are optional, but I'm not used to one where brakes are actively discouraged. Being somewhat better at the game now than I was in 1996, or at least playing with a much better controller, I find I can quite enjoy the championship mode. With a little bit of practice I was able to quickly blast through the first couple of championship leagues, unlocking a couple of tracks and being promoted to the pro league, only a couple of hours after exiting that lovingly crafted setup screen, and yes, I am counting the time I spent playing Roller Coaster Tycoon 2 in that couple of hours. But unfortunately, Getting to said Pro League is where the game falls apart a bit. The inevitable arcade rubber banding and wonky collision detection conspire to where a car will speed up to you, then either brake test or steer into you, completely oblivious to your location, and cause a crash, which, because all the other cars have been rubber banded up to ridiculous speeds, drops you to the back of the grid. And this happens constantly. Now in a slight saving throw, the game does let you continue from the point where you made your championship unwinnable, rather than forcing you to restart the whole thing, but this led to me playing the Pro League by driving round at an obviously race-winning pace, waiting for the one time in ten the game got through all three laps, without doing something obnoxious and cheap. This drove me mad. The Pro League is maybe only 20% more difficult in terms of raw driving skill needed, but it also approximately 300% more unfair for no useful end. See, Screamer is a slight game. You race the same six tracks in the same order over three championships, and yet again also in the same order in a special bonus round. But this is fine. It's what you want from an arcade racer of this era. The feeling that within a week you're going to know it inside out, and everything from that point on is down to skill rather than being beaten by someone who simply had more time to spend memorising hundreds of car and track combinations. Adding cheap tricks doesn't make this suddenly feel like a complex and long game, it makes it feel like a slight game which has been artificially extended with fake difficulty and, more importantly, ruins the premise of such an arcade racer. You play through it again and again, because it's such relentless fun, and that doesn't work if the fun relents for a quarter of the game just so it could take half an hour longer to finish. Ugh. Well, at least the games industry learned from this, and never again tried to pad out otherwise short games with fake difficulty and luck-based gameplay, and we certainly never see a racing game where the driver in third place would happily throw away their entire race if it meant being able to temporarily inconvenience the player. <sighs> oh, your reward for suffering for all this is the Bullet League, where you race a special hidden car called the Mysterious Trouser Bandit. Look, fine, it's pretty obvious from the name of the league it's called the Bullet, and this is the classic. Beat this game-breakingly fast car in a series of one-on-one -on -one races and you can have it. Despite clearly not needing it at that point. And yet, this end of game challenge is easier than the Pro League, because while you do need to be fast, you don't have to do it with an entire field of cars ping-ponging across the track at ridiculous rubber banded speeds. Indeed, the AI in fact drives the bullet quite slowly through corners. But despite this, despite how much anger this game arouses in me now I know how to play it and can see how many of my least favourite tropes of arcade racing games it embodies, trying to pretend it has more than a single afternoon's worth of content. I still find myself having a lot of fondness for Screamer, possibly more than I did in the day. Because looking at it now, it symbolises an era for me, one in which we were determined that the PC should be able to see off the new 3D consoles with nothing more than software rendering and brute force CPU power. We uh, kind of know how that went in the end. 3DFX sold a lot of voodoo cards as a result. And Screamer is perhaps not the best example, since it had a special 3D accelerated version with support for the S3 Verge graphics decelerator, 
or anyone who wanted to see the game running slower, with blurry texture filtering. I owned one of those cards at the time, and believe me, they were that bad. And if you don't believe me, you can watch Control Alt Rees play that version in his review of pre Voodoo 3D games and see for yourself. Look, Screamer was just what happened to be in the box and also not Spirit of Speed 1937, okay? And as for what happened next, Screamer was followed by the predictably named Screamer 2, and then by the slightly less predictably named but still obviously named Screamer Rally, by this time gaining Voodoo graphics support and making a very convincing case for bringing the arcade home, especially when played with a wheel. I didn't buy either, but by this point the PC market was saturated with arcade racers, to the point they were being given away free with graphics cards. There was also a Screamer 4x4, although that was by a different developer and much more of a traditional PC style sim game where you have to care about things like differential locks. Graffiti themselves had renamed to Milestone by this point, striking a publishing deal with EA for the first in what would become a very long line of Superbike games, eventually joined by a WRC license. I'm pretty sure I have that Superbike game in a box somewhere, and maybe we might get to look at it one day. If I feel up to delving into boxes, which do have a high chance of containing Spirit of Speed 1937. Oh, look at that! I'd forgotten that it had these wonderful sort of jelly menu. I really like special modes. No, no. There we go. Oh, I can't. Ugh! Oh, you must have free initials! You must! You must! It's it's mandatory to have free initials in, in Italy or wherever it's right.